Today I want to take you from ancient Greek philosophy all the way to modern physics and demonstrate some failures of reasoning that I think are really interesting. So let's learn a little bit about Heraclitus, the pre-Socratic philosopher, and how I think it connects a bit to string theory. I'm Luke, and this is Polymathy. That musical theme that you just heard that I use in so many of the videos on this channel and the theme music at the end, that's the overture of the magic flute. Now, what does that have to do with anything? Well, I got into Mozart, into his operas in particular, um, in middle school and into high school. I started listening to classical music, started to really like it. And about 6th, 7th, 8th grade, I was l listening especially to the Italian operas by Mozart, especially Le Nozze di Figaro, The Marriage of Figaro, and Don Giovanni. Really loved those. And I wasn't super keen on that super famous one, Die Zauberflöte, The Magic Flute, because, oh, that was in German. You know, I didn't want to learn that yet. But then I ended up taking German in high school. And in that first year of high school, I also got this. Gift, The Elegant Universe by Brian Greene, who is a theoretical physicist specializing in string theory. And this was a wonderful Christmas gift. And I got this just at the same time I was starting to listen to the magic flute for, I think, actually the first time. So wh what do those have to do with one another? Uh, and this is a way of explaining why I actually use the magic flute as the, the music in uh, the theme music of, of this channel. So the book here, The Elegant Universe, written by Brian Greene, is basically an explanation of string theory. So what's that? Now, Brian Greene is much better than I about explaining it. In fact, he's an excellent science communicator, speaks with so much passion and enthusiasm. String theory comes along and suggests that inside these particles, there is something else. So if I take a little quark, and I magnify it. Conventional idea says there's nothing inside, but string theory says I'll find a little tiny filament, a little filament of energy, a little string-like filament. In the description, I'll link some of the videos where he talks, and he's you know, such a great speaker. And he wrote this book, and it looks really cool on the cover. He explains very clearly, clear enough for my young brain to understand at the time, string theory and how it works and the whole concept. So. Uh, just to, to summarize more or less the idea, the motivation for string theory is that we have incredible physicists and physical explanations of the universe, which can trace their origins all the way back to the original philosophers. In fact, the original philosophers who are highly theoretical, highly abstract, trying to think of like imagine how the universe is, is organized, they were the original physicists. In fact, Physicist is essentially a short term. We have the, the Latin term meaning natural philosopher, philosophus naturalis. The word for nature in ancient Greek is pusis. Modern Greeks pronounce this physis. Gefidimu toxerete oti i proveratis classicis atikis dialectu ine polidio foretiki. Ne toxerete or piso toxerete. So pusis, physis, pusis means nature, giving us pusikos, physical. Natural. In modern Greek, physica means naturally. Ha, of course. So philosophers, later scientists of nature, physicists, but the original philosophers did a little bit of everything, naturally. And Heraclitus was one of these, and we'll talk about some of the things he said. One of his famous phrases is pantare, pandari in modern Greek pronunciation. Everything flows, which actually reminds me a bit of what Siddhartha said. So in more recent epics of physics, we've seen how disparate things like magnetism, something that was known even to the ancients, like Plato in his dialogue Ion, all the way up until the understanding of electricity, they were separate concepts, but they were unified together with Maxwell's field equations. And that just completely changed everything. It allows our world to exist. Every single electric motor from, obviously, the newfangled things like electric cars to a fan, air conditioner, pretty much the entire generation of electricity. It's incredible what this concept has done. The technology that we're able to use now to communicate via the internet, to make YouTube videos and all that. All that's possible thanks to our understanding of magnetism and electricity, of unifying those into one common theory. I'm 
hugely oversimplifying a lot of this. So you real physicists out there will uh, enjoy, I hope, the simplistic explanation I'm trying to give to a more general audience. But basically, we have the unification of these things, which have allowed these incredible uh, discoveries to understand how light and gravity work, just uh, which have created our ability to understand the universe, to create all sorts of advanced technologies from nuclear power to the internet. All these things are possible thanks to these uh, unifications, right, of the theories. No, there's something that never has yet truly been unified. And those two things are actually the pillars of modern physics, which are, of course, Einstein's theories of special and general relativity. And the other being quantum mechanics or quantum physics. So quantum mechanics and relativity can't be united simply because the math starts to break down in, in certain places, certain environments. So the problem is, okay, so we have two extremely good ways to understand the universe. Relativity, Einstein's theories, work extremely well for understanding the big stuff. Uh, planets, moons, galaxies, uh, these enormous scales of the universe, whereas quantum mechanics explains everything extremely well for the microscopic, especially the smaller we go, the more it just it makes sense. But even their approaches to the, the the concepts of what they're dealing with are at odds. Quantum mechanics, through observation, has determined basically statistical models to explain probability, and that the probability itself is a very good and accurate explanation of reality. And if I recall the quote right, Einstein said to that, well, God doesn't play dice. The randomness that the quantum physicists were describing was conceptually at odds with the smooth elegance, with the elegant universe that Einstein had uh, really made clear to us. So both these systems have been proven. They're both theories of how the universe works, and a theory being, of course, a set of observations collated into a clear explanation, especially that can be turned into mathematical formulae, and then being able to apply that practically, and of course, most importantly, to be able to have experimental observations, and you'll see how this applies to string theory and where it goes wrong. And for those of you who are here for the ancient Greek philosophy, don't worry, it's, it's coming. So be patient. Einstein spent the latter part of his life trying to unify everything into one grand unified theory of basically how gravity fits into the quantum mechanical model or vice versa. String theory is essentially an attempt at this grand unified theory, this way to explain all of the physical phenomena of the universe. Since these two things, relativity, which is essentially an updated version of classical Newtonian physics, and quantum mechanics, which is just so different, but both of them explain their regions of the universe so well, it just it seems implausible that this universe, which clearly is one contiguous thing from the microscopic all the way to the macroscopic, how could there be two different kinds of physics and understanding uh, why don't they go together, ultimately? That's the, that's the issue. So string theory is an attempt to solve that by coming up with a really clever, really elegant idea. So I'll give a really simple explanation for our understanding of how particles work. Maybe you've heard of particle wave duality, of all these really fascinating quantum mechanical concepts. But fundamentally, the standard model, which explains how the fundamental building blocks of atoms work, all these you know, these quarks and gluons and muons, the Higgs boson, all these wonderful things, including new discoveries like the, the Higgs boson, which was predicted by the standard model and recently discovered. So these particles, every single one of them, sometimes you see them depicted as spheres, but it's mostly just so you can write a Greek letter <laughs> on them so you know what they are. They're understood in the mathematical model of the standard model to be points, zero dimension. Well, what is that? Zero dimension. We don't experience the world in zero dimensions. I mean, it's, not, it's not a little ball. It's not a three-dimensional thing. The answer is no in the standard model. It's just a point. But that little point of a quark, which is way more massive than an electron, but the electron, it has much less mass, but it doesn't. neither of them have any dimension. Now, they have ways of influencing each other tremendously through various forces like the strong force, the weak force, the electromagnetic force, and obviously gravity, though, that only, we only observe that on long distances. They're just points. That's the standard model. And it would be really great to observe at a higher level of resolution, but we can't because certain fundamental principles 
of quantum mechanics, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. If we could just get some Heisenberg compensators. I run a scan on the Heisenberg compensators. Get right on it, Mr. O'Brien. We could actually maybe observe the subatomic particles with some kind of resolution to see what they really are. Are they actually points? Do they have some kind of dimensionality to them? So string theory proposes that, well, maybe they aren't points. Maybe they are one-dimensional strings formed in a little loop. And that as a way to then explain how come these, in the standard model, these little points of zero dimension, they have mass, they have spin, they have all of the, they've charged, they have all these different properties. Well, why do they have these properties? The answer in string theory is that, oh, because there's these little vibrating strings. String theory says I'll find a little tiny filament, a little filament of energy, a little string-like filament. And just like the string on a violin, I pluck it and it vibrates creates a little musical note that I can hear. The little strings in string theory, when they vibrate, they don't produce musical notes, they produce the particles themselves. So a quark is nothing but a string vibrating in one pattern. An electron is nothing but a string vibrating in a different pattern. A neutrino, nothing but a string vibrating in a different pattern still. And their vibrations, different frequencies and different ways, different directions that they're vibrating in, almost like the vibrations on a violin, are what then create the properties of mass and of charge and of gravity and all these different amazing things, these, these incredible properties of the universe. They'll come from the vibrations of the strings. So beautifully and elegantly described by Brian Greene here, this universe is an enormous and nearly infinite, perhaps entirely infinite symphony of the music of these strings vibrating harmoniously. There's nothing but a dancing, vibrating cosmic symphony of strings. That's the basic idea of string theory. The elegance of music itself with this theory. I can't help but be reminded of the scene from Amadeus. This was a music I've never heard. When Salieri, as an old man, recounts the first time he heard Mozart's music. Filled with such longing, such unfulfillable longing. It seemed to me that I was hearing a voice of God. Excuse me. It's such a beautiful and elegant model. It does entail some issues, though. In order to make it work, you can't just have four dimensions. Now, what are these dimensions? You may have heard of like dimensions in science fiction, like, oh, the from another dimension. Invaders from the fifth dimension. Invaders hey, from the fifth dimension. calm down. Di and that's more like from another universe or something we can imagine. That's usually what they, they tend to mean by that in the sci-fi jargon. Uh, but there are dimensions. We experience three physical dimensions, right? In the sense that there is depth and width and height. And that is the mathematical uh, reduction of the, you know, you can go in any direction. You can understand the three dimensions in a spherical coordinate system or in the Cartesian coordinate system. You can understand these things in different ways, but we fundamentally have three physical dimensions and we also have the dimension of time. And of course, Einstein demonstrated how time itself is also manipulated by mass and energy. It's just in these incredible, insane things that have been demonstrated experimentally. Crazy things like the faster you accelerate something towards the speed of light, the slower that time passes for that object or that rocket ship or whatever you want to imagine, which is amazing. That's, by the way, how particle accelerators work. These incredible, huge devices that accelerate subatomic particles at enormous speeds to smash them together. What precision, what incredible thing that physicists do. And when, you know, when they do that, all these other particles come out. And that works because they accelerate them so quickly near the speed of light and then smash them together because they were moving so quickly so close to the speed of light, their mass increased. There's actually more mass. It's unbelievable. And then that mass is converted into energy upon the uh, implosion of the two <laughs> particles together and then explode out into all sorts of other fundamental particles that we've discovered. So this is these, the revolutions of the 20th century and that go on to this day, understanding how these sub atomic particles work and their, their spins and just incredible stuff. So thank God for all these incredible scientists that have given us this amazing understanding of the universe, right? So four dimensions, three of space and one of time. That's the universe, right? 
String theory requires that there be more. Not just one more spatial dimension. If you've heard of a tesseract, that's a four-dimensional, four-physical-dimensional cube. Uh, this is a representation of what we can imagine one to be like. The reason this is so weird is because, okay, well, what's a, what would it be a physical four-dimensional cube? So it would have five dimensions because there's also time, obviously. There's always time. We're not really getting rid of time. No, no time soon, for sure. So a uh, tesseract, this looks so weird because imagine representing a cube on a piece of paper. This is a simple drawing technique that we all learn at some point normally. You know, you have a box, another box, and you draw it like, oh, okay, I have the sense of, uh, of depth of this imaginary object on a two-dimensional piece of paper. The tesseract, and you can see it kind of rotating here, this is meant to give us still a two-dimensional representation of a four-dimensional physical object. So it's very difficult to wrap our heads around. But not just four physical dimensions. In fact, altogether, including time, string theory requires ten dimensions. And string theory this is coming out of the, the mid um, to late 20th century, right? So ten dimensions. Great. One of time, nine of space. What's wrong with that? Well, we don't observe them. The three dimensions of space are perfectly clear for us to understand, but even conceiving much less the fact that we we can't see them. There's no observation of these other six physical dimensions, so where the heck are they? And one explanation is that they are compacted, that they are are curled around. Now, what does that mean? It's, this is very abstract stuff. The math, obviously works out to explain all these things. And this is sort of where we're getting to that math can explain so many things, including imaginary numbers, including a whole bunch of things that go beyond what seems to be physically possible or actually extant in the universe. Math seems to be nearly boundless in that sense, which is amazing. So the fact that the math works out in string theory doesn't necessarily mean that it'll actually explain everything perfectly. Think also of the epicycles. In the Ptolemaic model of the universe, we're able to explain all the weird perturbations of the planets because, oh yeah, they're all still going on the Earth, but they're just they're doing weird little loop-de-loop -loop things. Brian Greene explains the compact dimensions with a power line. Imagine we can look outside and we can see a power line. It's just a line, right? That's why it's called a power line. Well, line in mathematics is a one-dimensional thing. It's only a line. It doesn't have any width or depth. It's only a line. Well, that power line, it's not just a line, though. If we were to put an ant on it, had an ant's eye view of walking on this thing, we'd say, oh, no, this is actually a three-dimensional object, not a one-dimensional object. Not only can we walk along the line, but we can also walk around it. We can see that this is something that has all the dimensions, all three dimensions of space. So the idea is that compacted within the, the obvious realm of these larger dimensions that very, very, very microscopically there exist the other six spatial dimensions. Consider this. If you look at the uh, instrument, a French horn, notice that the vibrations of the airstreams are affected by the shape of the instrument. Now in string theory, all the numbers are reflections of the way strings can vibrate. So just as those airstreams are affected by the twists and turns in the instrument, Strings themselves will be affected by the vibrational patterns and the geometry within which they are moving. Notice that the way they vibrate is affected by the geometry of the extra dimensions. So if we knew exactly what the extra dimensions look like, we don't yet, but if we did, we should be able to calculate the allowed notes. So this incredible, beautiful, elegant universe, I, you, you say the title of this, this is my book from, that I got in 1999, beautiful, wonderful, I'm so glad I have it. Uh, still, because it had such a, an impact on me. Wow, this whole universe is like an orchestra of nearly infinite, potentially actually infinite little little violins and cellos. It's, it's, it's this beautiful image. And I associated that with the magic flute, especially the overture, because the overture of the magic flute is just so uplifting and beautiful and it's kind of mysterious, but mostly it's just happy and inspiring and it's just this this sound, like Mozart is so amazing, you know that. If you don't know that, hopefully you find some of his music interesting because it's just so incredible, these, these sounds and how this orchestra builds and it's just, it feels like the waves of the strings of the Particle wave duality is just, I've seen a bunch of nonsense just because it's fun. Uh, it just, it feels so, so right and amazing. The music with this idea, the string theory, and 
this whole universe is something that we can learn and understand. That's something that Isaac Newton really uh, revolutionized. Like, wow, we can understand the whole universe. We could actually do that. We just have to keep working for decades and centuries and perhaps millennia. We'll, we'll get there. We'll understand things so much better than we do now. That was the, the promise of Isaac Newton. And this is string theory. is another one of these amazing things that wow this does it and with that music which i was just really starting to listen to specifically the magic flute i came to associate the beauty of understanding with the overture of the magic flute everything that is beautiful and wonderful and and fascinating and worthy of study worthy of learning in the universe polymathy that's what i associated with uh the overture of the magic flute, and that's why it's the theme song of of the channel. That's why you hear the initial tone at the beginning, and why you hear uh, an edited version that I did of uh, the rest of the overture for for the uh, the outro, of the credits, if you will, of, of pretty much every video. And uh, the music continues to inspire me, and and you know, even every time I, I edit a, a video, uh, I'm happy to say I'm not bored of it yet. <laughs> After hundreds of videos. Uh, and I, if, I hope you're not, not too tired of hearing it because it's such an uh, uplifting tune. That's what I hope anyway. And uh, then you get, of course, get to see all the wonderful patrons who support what I do. And I'm so grateful to all of them. Because this, this amazing ability, wow, we can understand everything. And string theory, this brings us the promise of understanding even more. And the advantage of string theory, with its incredibly elegant mathematics, is that it is able to unify gravity with quantum mechanics. Well, that's how, what these uh, science communicators have been telling us. Now, if you watch the Big Bang Theory, you might recall that Sheldon was a string theorist. And that, amazingly, right along with his character arc, towards the end of the final season, if I recall, he had to give up string theory as many other physicists have. Am I wasting my life on a theory that can never be proven? Maybe, but how great is Game of Thrones? <laughs> While Danny kind of forgot about the Iron Fleet and Euron's forces. I am not here to be queen of the ashes. Best season ever! Angela Collier is a YouTuber and she is a physicist, so she explains this whole thing much better than I do, so I definitely recommend her video. Essentially what happens is that string theory ends up becoming hyped for decades, promising the in incredible notion that, well, you know, when we learned how to turn magnets on and off with electricity, well, soon we might be able to do that with gravity, which is something that we see in, say, you know, Star Trek, that we can actually have gravity plating that we can turn on and off controlled from the bridge of a starship, right? That's is incredible. And that would be just so useful and it's so convenient for spaceships and TV shows <laughs> because they're film sets in Hollywood and they need to have gravity. It's very difficult not to have gravity when you're filming. I promise I'm getting to Heraclitus and the Greek philosophy. This is coming in here, don't I promise. So Sheldon has to give up string theory and realize that this isn't something that's going to work anymore. This is something that I've spent my whole life on, but I can't anymore because it's not working. What happened? In addition to Andrew Collier's video, this one from PBS Space Time is excellent to help explain all of this. And if this is new to you, it's fascinating and it's worth understanding well, even though string theory seems to have led to a dead end. The problem is that for a theory to be a theory, it needs to be testable. And the tests that have been run so far, such as to find supersymmetry, which was one of the predictions of a version of string theory, well, they tested it, and they weren't able to find what they needed. The extra dimensions haven't been discovered, and they were expected to. Now, that's either because we don't have enough technology or understanding of this theory, for all its incredible complexity, is still limited enough that it's still the right theory, but we just don't have the correct understanding of the physics or, or the math in, in some way, which would mean, ah, oh, keep working on string theory or the technology. Ah, oh, we need to work on the engineering in order to be able to 
find the evidence to make these discoveries. But ultimately, a lot of the, uh, the other physicists, the non-string theory physicists, have been getting annoyed, such as Angela Collier, as she explains in this video. Uh, and Brian, it's been 50, 40 years, so I'm very disappointed. I thought you ought to have this solved back in the 90s. But you know, do you mind if I actually address that? Because I know it's like partly a joke, but there are people who with a straight face really do say that. You guys said you'd wrap it up in five or seven years, what's going on? And I just have to keep <laughs> educating them that science is not like, you know, a company where you lay out your product development timeline. So this is the kind of experiment that we'll be looking at in the next five, seven to 10 years or so. And if this experiment bears fruit, if we see that kind of particle ejected by noticing that there's less energy in our dimensions than when we began, this will show that the extra dimensions are real. And this is the problem that Angela Collier pointed out. Not that, just as Brian Greene said in 2023, that, oh, obviously it takes a huge amount of time to try to solve these problems. That's understood, especially with difficult scientific issues. But the fact that string theorists for decades kept promising, you know, it's five to ten years, and then eventually nothing came out of it. That's the issue, the hyping that was done by many science communicators, string theorists like Brian Greene himself. The whole thing with string theory has become this debacle in science communication. And as a communicator of educational topics, this is a big deal because when you, when you read uh, an article and you know a little bit about science or some kind of specialized field, but I always recognize this right from the beginning, just how illiterate in science journalists were. I recognize this from an early age. Like I knew some stuff I could see on the documentaries on uh, Nova or <laughs> these other uh, lovely uh, things, the Discovery Channel. And when I was a kid, I understand when I was reading articles, as I got into all, I'm reading the you know, newspaper and online and you know the, the news. And these journalists just have no idea what they were talking about. And they were totally re misrepresenting the most basic things and I found that very very frustrating and as Angela Collier points out essentially this led to the general public along with journalists no longer trusting not just string theory proponents but all physicists and all scientists say ah and this is not good a healthy skepticism and and anything is good it leads to inquiry and further understanding but the rejection of very obvious and very well understood principles like, say, the curvature of the earth. It's really terrible because virtually every human being has a chance to understand these incredible, wonderful, and important fundamental aspects of the physical universe, of physics, of science, of nature, and yet would reject them because some science communicators ended up uh, exaggerating what they were doing or what they could do or what their theories might prove so that's a, a big a big deal and it's incumbent upon every single one of us i believe this is the most important theme of my channels to explore and to, to learn uh, you know there's there's so much to that we can learn from each other and from people in the past it's just like so much that's an it's an understatement there's so much that we ought to learn and we need to learn. And it is so amazing and elegant and beautiful, right? This is uh, Brian Greene would exhort us to, to want to know about all these things. It's great. But the loss of trust with respect, not just to string theory, but to physics in general, because for decades, for the better part of 50 years, people were saying, String theory, we'll prove it. Ten years, we'll prove it. Gonna get some amazing things going to happen, you know, leading to turning gravity on and off and, uh, and all these uh, incredible things. And the ex there's no experimental evidence to prove it. It's a simply an explanation that's not even wrong. And before we had telescopes, before Galileo, before the heliocentric model of the universe had sufficient evidence, the geocentric model of the universe, the little epicycles of the planets, that was a better explanation. There was nothing else to say that that couldn't work. That was a perfectly mathematical, accurate explanation for the data available. That seems to be the dead end of string theory. Now, there could be more evidence that comes up 
better ways of understanding the string theory and the super string theory and M theory and all these other variations on the model. And I'll refer you to these other videos to learn a little bit more about the skepticism or criticism that has become more vocal regarding string theory. What I think it demonstrates is how versions of logic, like mathematics, oh gosh, they're so useful. I need to say that first. They're so important and they're so worthy of understanding uh, in detail and in gross. You know, we, we should understand these things as much as we can, as we have, have time to, as the ancient philosophers taught us, because it's good in itself to learn how these things work. It's a, a beautiful thing in itself that we have the capacity to understand as much as we do, to understand how gravity is bending light around galaxies. That's incredible. That's mind-blowing. What a gift to be able to receive that knowledge, right? The but here is about how systems like the epicycles and the Ptolemaic model of the universe don't actually represent the real world, but mathematically, with the evidence available, we're perfectly coherent. So, Heraclitus, I'm working on an audiobook, uh, The Dialogues of, of Plato. Um, and it's a little bit more interesting than that, but uh, when it comes out, I'll tell you more about it. And I wanted to learn a little bit more about the philosophy to make sure I actually understood what Plato wanted me to understand when reading his dialogues. So I found this great YouTuber by the name of Gregory Sadler. <laughs> Gregory, Greek name. <laughs> And this has helped me to understand what Plato is trying to teach a bit better. Actually, one of my favorite classes in high school, again, the high school age, uh, was actually a philosophy class I got to take at a nearby university. It was one of those um, kind of uh, nice things you could do uh, at the end of the senior year. So that was a really cool experience. And interestingly, I also remember how the professor of that class, because uh, I... I never, I was, new philosophy would be interesting, but I didn't know how much uh, it would really help me to become rational. Well, not completely rational, no one is, I certainly am not, but more rational than I was. A perfect age for that too, you know, end of high school. And uh, so I, sometimes after class, I'd ask the professor, who was actually a Greek American, uh, as I recall, I wish I could remember his name, uh, but he was so passionate and interested in the subject, and he knew that I was also interested in, in science and in physics, and he pointed out to me an article by uh, Stephen Hawking, who was still alive uh, back then, and, point, and where he circled all the logical fallacies of what Stephen Hawking was saying. <laughs> Stuff that just didn't make sense, like, and it's, which is interesting, because the burden of being logical in a very clear way, like it it's absolutely true that you need to understand math at a very high level to truly understand physics. But at the very least, how he was, Stephen Hawking, describing things were failing basic logical tests, which is very interesting. And it was, it was great for the, for the joy to help the professor so much. Like, look, this doesn't make any sense. You're like, <laughs> so funny. Mustache, gray hair. He was um, just uh, fabulously inspiring. Specifically, I remember the thing that he was complaining about. I don't recall... If, Stephen Hawking was actually speaking of string theory in particular because Stephen Hawking wrote and spoke about a number of really fascinating things that have very much advanced our understanding of the universe and physics in general. But what he was saying in that article that really teed off the philosophy professor was the fact that he was saying that when there's more than one mathematical explanation for some physical phenomenon... Also note, a lot of people are saying phenomenon, the singular, and phenomenon in the plural. Stop that. I know I'm prescriptivist in this, but phenomenon, uh, pinomenon in an ancient Greek pronunciation, that's singular. It's, new, it's a neuter word, so that's why it's pinomena in, uh, in the neuter plural. Okay, just so you know. Phenomenon, phenomena, singular, plural. Okay, thank you. I say, as I say, thank you, the non-standard pronunciation of thank. I can say thank. I just prefer to say thank because I received that pronunciation. What Stephen Hawking was saying that was so annoying to the philosophy professor was that when there's more than one explanation, mathematical explanation for some thing, like it could be a black hole, string theory, etc., that what is chosen is the more elegant mathematical model. Are you proposing that everything's made of strings just so that it's more elegant? No. Yeah, certainly Ooh, not. The man who wrote the book, The Elegant Universe. Mm -hmm. Is this a philosophical motivating force for you? Because Kepler 
had his own philosophically motivating mathematics where the planets were platonic solids and it was beautiful because it was it was math and it was and are you why do why what confidence do we have that you are describing reality and not a reality you want to be true so that the universe becomes elegant so that you can sell more books <laughs> <laughs> you, <laughs> you in the industrial string complex. What is the wrong no, aesthetics in, in making these decisions? And I would say that we theorists do use mathematical aesthetics at times. And my professor had such a huge problem with that because what it means is that we're just choosing things based off of beauty. Like this is going back to pre-Socratic philosophers even. It's not even really rational. It's more of just an expression of, of course, loving the beauty of the universe, but then also reciprocally doing something that's weirdly prescriptive, right? I kind of like my saying that, oh, you shouldn't say phenomena in the singular because it's phenomenon in the, sing in the singular. Well, there are all kinds of things that are now normal parts of speech that used to be hypercorrections or used to be just just incorrect. A great example is how we say, aren't I? I'm an American, aren't I? Aren't I? So what? that's a contraction, aren't I? Sounds perfectly normal to any native speaker of English. Most of us, there are some who still have retained an older form. It's actually wrong. It's prescriptively wrong because it was made prescriptively right. What I mean by that? Well, uh, we have, I am not. I'm not. We can contract that as we do, but this is a more recent contraction. The older contraction, which is no longer current, we'll take a word tis. People don't say tis anymore. That contraction fell out of favor. It's is the only really normal contraction you'll hear anymore unless it's a more old-fashioned type of speech. So it's is what we say, and tis is not wrong, but it's fallen out of fashion. It sounds archaic now. Well, before, instead of I'm not, the alternative contraction was I amn't. I amn't. Isn't that interesting? I amn't. And so we have the six persons, right? I am not. I amn't. You are not. You aren't. Or you're not. Those are both current. You aren't and you're not. And then we have he, she, it, isn't. Or even he, he's not, she's not, it's not. Those are all current. We're not, we aren't. You, plural. So you're not, you aren't, and they're not, they aren't. All of these are current and they have different uses throughout the English language. But the I one lacks one of them. I amn't. That one's no longer current. What happened? Because I amn't was further contracted into ain't. I ain't. I ain't grammatically speaking, is perfectly correct. So how did it become so vilified? It became vilified because I ain't, ain't, this really useful, simple sound, one syllable ain't, it's a negation, right? Well, people started to use ain't in other places. They started to use it for not just I ain't, which Grammatically, I amn't or I ain't, it should be perfectly correct, but you ain't, and he ain't, and she ain't, and it ain't, and we ain't, and they ain't. And using it that way, those others that where it's not the pronoun I, based on the etymology, those are wrong. So prescriptively, those are wrong. And then came the feeling that, oh, ain't is always wrong. How did that happen? Well, probably we had some teachers who knows how long ago saying that he ain't is wrong. And then the person learned, oh, not that simply that in the isolated cases of the second person singular and plural, the third person plural, uh, the first person plural, that's where ain't prescriptively, etymologically is, is wrong. They associate, oh, ain't is always wrong. Because it's wrong you know, five out of six times on the paradigm. Then even for I, it should be wrong. And thus, instead of am ain't I or ain't I, aren't I. But if you think about, about it, I are... American? That's totally wrong. <laughs> I are a man. You know, this is not like a total idiot. It's completely wrong, but aren't I? Aren't I a man? Aren't I American? You know, these, these things, right? So that demonstrates how a prescription ends up being misunderstood and totally messing up everything to the point where we can't ever have ain't 
Again, I doubt that'll ever make its way back. It still is current, I believe, and the first person singular in some Scottish and Irish speech of the English language to this day. And thank goodness, because I think it's wonderful and it's beautiful and I guess archaic. You know, it sounds wrong to people, and that's a shame. Another one which is coming around today, and it's we were almost losing our English grammar, at least as we understood it. It'll still be English. It'll still be grammar. It'll just be different is another hypercorrection also from educated classes because language change doesn't always come from the bottom up it also uh, can frequently come from the top down is to say um, oh maybe this, this book wasn't just for me but it was a gift for me and my sister it's for her and i Ooh! now if you have um, an ear for grammar you can hear how completely terrible that sounds for her and i it's for him and i why is that wrong? Well, I is a subject pronoun, and that subject pronoun, I, cannot follow a preposition, such as for. For I, we know that's wrong. And yet people of all levels of education now, because they, well, they learned that something else that was wrong, they, they replaced the correct for you and me with for you and I, which is still prescriptively wrong in English. And if we don't fight it, <laughs> uh, it will probably become the new standard form, but maybe we'll be aware enough, thanks to the internet and so forth, to, to not go down that road. I, found, I really remember hearing it in one of my, uh, my bosses, uh, the colonel, many years ago, and it was, it was just like, what is going on? How can, how can someone, I was thinking, have such a high education level and make such a mistake? But I didn't understand yet enough about linguistics and how um, you have to understand these kind of paradigmatical things in order to really follow why it's wrong, to have the logic to understand why it doesn't make sense. And the reason that this hypercorrection is becoming more popular is because a common mistake, prescriptively an error in grammar, that is a non-standard English grammar thing, there's has been around for a while that has been vilified quite a bit, which is saying, me and him are going to the store. Him and her are cousins, that kind of thing. And... What is that all about? Why are these pronouns being used wrong? Either from the top down saying, for him and I, or saying, him and me are out of here. Well, we have a couple good examples of that. One that's really obvious is, say, the French. C'est moi, right? In English, we'd say, it's me. Um, or in somewhat more formal sounding English, maybe even archaic at this point, we'd say, it's I. It's I. It is I. Even saying, saying it's I as the contraction doesn't seem to work because the contraction almost sounds too re too relaxed and uh, it is I. It almost sounds wrong. In fact, I remember getting trained as a, as a kid by my parents to answer the phone if the phone call were for me. Uh, hello, is this Luke? This is he. Instead of saying, this is him, which was certainly more common back in that day and I believe remains so. Well, why? Why is that understood to be wrong? Because... You have the, the copula, right? The verb to be. And on either side, you should have, or is it either? Is it either or either? There's another prescriptive thing. It should be the subject pronouns on both sides, like Latin does, right? But if that were the case, then why does French say, c'est moi, c'est toi, c'est lui? Those aren't the subject pronouns. Je, tu, il. Those are the subject pronouns, but it's c'est moi, c'est toi. What the heck's going on? Italian is also very useful at this comparison because I remember learning from a very old textbook uh, that I got from my father who had gotten it when he went to Italy in the middle of the 20th century, right? Uh, which had some more formal usages, including the words that say he and she, which were described as egli and ella, which obviously come from the ille and illa of Latin, right? Well, I would eventually discover when I learned Italian a bit better, no one uses those anymore. They are almost completely gone from the language. In other words, like say, uh, esso, essi, esse, and so forth, those are re remaining, those that sono rimaste, uh, what do I want to say? They remain in uh, formal speech and written speech, but they don't really exist in a normal way, in a normal conversation. Maybe a professor could use them when getting into more you know, technical discussion, but they're just not, they're basically defunct from the normal Italian language. And you sound like a fool if you answer a question, Chi l'ha fatto? Egli l'ha fatto. It's archaic. 
Lui l'ha fatto. And that's a more recent development in the past 100 years or so in the Italian language. So when it comes to the fact that we have the current change, uh, hypercorrection, going in the opposite direction of saying vulgar, if you will, uh, idea of using the object pronouns, me, him, her, them, as subject pronouns. Well, why is that happening? Because even back in Italian, lui and lei, they were always emphatic versions of egli and ella. And as they are in, say, French, c'est moi, because there are emphatic pronouns, moi, toi. Those are the emphatic versions of je and tu that can't occur on their own in that spontaneous way. English grammar is not dependent on French grammar or German grammar, you know. English grammar is English grammar. While German isn't going to use mich for an emphatic subject pronoun, they'll use ich, you know. Uh, you might hear someone say, wer? And you say, ich, me, in normal English, not I, because it's too weird. It's too weird, ormai. Why am I thinking in Italian? It's already too weird. It's just not, doesn't work for the language anymore. So back to Stephen Hawking. So Stephen Hawking irritated the heck out of my philosophy professor because he was saying that when you have more than one mathematical model to describe the phenomenon, then you choose the more elegant, the more beautiful mathematical model. Math can be beautiful. It really can be. I'm, I'm such a, a novice when it comes to all that, but I've had enough experience in uh, the higher sciences and math to see that and to feel, especially with something like the, the theory of relativity, you know, E equals MC squared. It's like, we all kind of hear that. But how much it explains just does so much, and it's amazing. So the logical fallacy as my professor of philosophy saw it, is that this is nonsense. You're, choo you're prescribing your aesthetic preferences on the universe? I thought this was science. You know, this is how he, he felt about it. And I'll, and I'll re always remember this. It was really um, enlightening. It encouraged me to look, you know, really skeptically at, uh, at anything, to investigate more, to, to learn more, to understand more, not necessarily to take any authority, you know, at their, their word. Uh, however... Having become specialized in a few subjects myself, I can also understand and appreciate, well, yeah, there is an intuition that you develop for certain things, like my uh, research projects that revolve around historical phonology, for example. Like you can feel like, uh, you know, this, this makes sense or this doesn't. And then you also have to really, I remember the professor telling me like, well, you know, is this just a convenient convention? that you like, and that's why, you know, you want that to be true, and I've seen this in other, other colleagues, I've definitely seen it in myself, this preference for something like, oh, well, you know, it it's elegantly solves this problem, and it's probably, you know, it's right, it's like, oh, yeah, well, then we should probably call it what it is, which is not, you know, uh, I mean, it's as open as Stephen Hawking was about it, this kind of openness about the elegance of one thing or another, which is derived from intuition. But there are all kinds of things that are so unintuitive, at first at least, like, say, magnetism. You ever, you hear the, the right hand rule? The insanity of that, that the magnetic field, it, it's, the math works out such that it's going around and uh, as if, like, in a, in, at a right angles to the actual direction of, of the, the field, and that's how elect electricity and magnetism work. You know, Maxwell and helped to solve all of this and may, help it make a lot more sense. But, but it's just, it's insane. Like, the, the, the nature is intuitive only insofar as we understand it. And if we've understood something wrong, which it seems that, you know, string theory had this wonderful, beautiful, elegant idea, well, there's no evidence for it. Maybe it's just an intuition which doesn't necessarily lead to the right conclusion. And now I'm finally going to get to Heraclitus. Thank you for your patience. So Heraclitus, he talked about the liar. So I've been watching this wonderful YouTuber, Gregory Sadler, philosophy professor, doing these wonderful explanations, summarizing 
each one of Plato's dialogues and also the pre-Socratic philosophers like Heraclitus. Because I wasn't you know, thinking that much about Her Heraclitus and these pre-Socratic philosophers, but I thought, oh, let me just get a whole context of the pre-Socratic stuff too. I had this way back in that class I took at that uh, nearby college long ago, and I'd like to you know, re review a little bit more about this, especially since I understand ancient Greek now, so I can actually read it and appreciate it a little bit more. So Professor Sedler he talked about Heraclitus. Here is the quote about the liar. That, of course, is in the reconstructed pronunciation of classical Attic, so... For any native Greek speakers, that's why it doesn't sound like modern Greek, because modern Greek and ancient Greek sound quite different. Please read the Wikipedia article on the subject that's linked in the description. In any case, what does he say in English? Men do not know how that which is drawn in different directions harmonizes with itself. The harmonious structure of the world depends upon opposite tension, like that of the bow and the lyre. So this metaphor of the lyre and the bow an object that creates war and chaos is in balance is in balance with the the lyre with music these are both things that create tension and then there's a release of tension this creates uh in, in the case of music something beautiful in the case of the bow and arrow so it creates war and heraclitus said that the nature of zeus uh, was this duality between war and peace and chaos and beauty uh, uh, harmony and, and disharmonious things. And it's a really beautiful idea. It sounds a lot like string theory, doesn't it? That the beautiful elegance of the universe is something that is disharmoniously harmonized. And that has an intuitive veracity to it. Uh, I like that. But he talks a little bit more about Heraclitus, of course, and he mentioned how Heraclitus also talked about the need for war. Polymus bandon men bateristi, bandon de basileus, kai tuus men teus edikse, tuus de antropus, tuus men dulus e boies e tuus de leuterus. War is the father of all and the king of all, and some he has made gods and some men, some slaves and some free. How war is necessary to really bring out the best in people. And I'm you know, just, just paraphrasing this, but then listening to this, I was like, wait a minute. Muroi gar misones, misonas muiras lancanusi. Greater deaths win greater portions. Perpetual war, that just, that's, I don't know, it sounds like 1930s Germany that you need to have constant war in order to create a good people. I don't really jive with that. They don't really like that. Hoteos polemos irene. God is war and peace. I'm somewhat exaggerating how much Heraclitus was emphasizing war, but the professor Gregory Sadler did talk about this, so I thought it was interesting, mostly my gut reaction. That doesn't jive with my understanding of the world. I mean, Heraclitus existed only at the beginning of democracies and at the, the potential for, you know, a more peaceful world that we live in today that he couldn't possibly have imagined. For all the terrible war that exists in, in the world, even... Even today, it's so much less warlike, our world, than uh, it, it used to be, especially in the time of uh, the ancient Greek city-states. The difference is that we have incredibly powerful technologies that are quite lethal, so thank goodness we've been able to keep from annihilating ourselves. But in any case, the notion that, ah, the, you know, the, the contest brings out the best in people, and there, there's definitely something in that that I resonated with. But the idea that, no, you need war. You need to have, basically, you have to, people have to die... <laughs> Or be really badly hurt to bring out the best of people. It's like, hmm, I don't know, I don't know about that, Heraclitus. So this and some other things that Heraclitus uh, liked and philosophized about, they have an elegance, they have a logic in of themselves, but they don't necessarily make for the best recommendations, the best prescriptions for society, or even the best descriptions of it. And this is also comparable the string theory such a beautiful elegant model but didn't pan out maybe it will maybe it won't but most people have kind of like 
left that. And people also don't necessarily think that much about uh, the fragments of Heraclitus that maybe some people do like, like me because the Greek is relatively easy to, to read and it's kind of fun. But the really important foundation of philosophy is the from Socrates forward, Plato, Aristotle. That's the more important stuff, as interesting and as fascinating as the pre-Socratic stuff is. So that's what I kind of put together. Heraclitus had some good ideas, led some good stuff later, some other stuff that worked intuitively for him but doesn't for me and for a lot of people today uh led to better stuff beautiful amazing elegant mathematics that have come out of this that have inspired so many people for decades get into string theory and develop all sorts of wonderful things that have led to different kinds and improved understandings of physics and math in different ways but the theory itself doesn't actually pan out we don't really know if there was those other six or seven dimensions of physical space wrapped up, and we, we can't prove it. That makes it maybe not really a theory then, if it has no way of being proven. We need a way to see experimental evidence for it. And that actually does remind me of something else that Heraclitus wrote, which was, Pusis gruptes tai pili. That's the classical Attic pronunciation, minor Greek pronunciation, physis. Nature loves to hide itself. Which is interesting because it also leads to the, <laughs> the whole point about intuition. Our intuition for the universe, the fact, you know, the fact that Galileo demonstrated that uh, objects of a similar shape at different masses fall at the same rate. That blew people's minds when he did that at Pisa, right? From the Leaning Tower of Pisa. You drop a 5-kilogram cannonball and a 10-kilogram cannonball, you'd expect the heavy one to fall first. That's the intuition. But I grew up hearing, uh, being fascinated by science, so I grew up hearing about, no, this is, this is proven. So my intuition is like, oh, well, that's obviously the case. And the reason that other light objects, like a feather or whatever, a piece of paper, a leaf, they fall more slowly due to different kinds of physical interactions, namely air resistance. But gravity itself is a constant, especially when you're close to the surface of the earth, right? So this is, so one's intuition is based simply on what we know. So it doesn't mean that physicists don't know anything. Oh my gosh, how much stuff do they know? It's incredible. Uh, including physicists like these, these wonderful science communicators who have helped to revolutionize our understanding of the elegant universe. I'll put the link to Amazon description if you want to get, this is my copy from 1999. Maybe we will discover that if it's not string theory, the universe really is elegant and orderly just the, the way our, dare I say, God-given intuition might actually want to, to reveal to us. Or maybe it's not. Maybe it's really weird, like, like magnetism. It's so, there's so many weird things in the universe that we can develop an intuition for. Maybe we need to develop an intuition through the careful study of the, the pusis of the nature. And it will be elegant and beautiful, just not in a way that we can appreciate yet, since we come from a very specific <laughs> type of, of mammal and a very specific planet and a very specific point in the galaxy and the universe. And our perspective is, uh, thank goodness we can see so much and it's amazing with our telescopes and our microscopes and everything in between. Uh, but it is a limited perspective. Um, and we rightly should keep learning everything that we can to help move forward our understanding on the personal level, collaboratively on the, the professional level, and to learn all there is to know that we possibly can. That's the, the really rich part of life. And I think the ancient philosophers would agree with that sentiment, I, I hope. El Bijo. Thanks so much for watching, and thanks to each and every one of my Patreon supporters, and enjoy listening to one of my favorite pieces of music that continues to inspire me to this day, the Overture to the magic flute. Walete. Yugi Hayate.